Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinar's Green Chemistry and Sustainability Series. I'm John Christensen, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. You're joining this program along with hundreds of viewers from top businesses, universities, and governments from around the world. Thank you all so much for joining us today. ACS Webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Chemical Society connecting you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders in chemical sciences, management, and business. Today's presentation features Morgan Barr and will be moderated by Dr. Robert Peoples, director of the ACS Green Chemistry Institute. This episode of ACS Webinars is co-produced with the ACS Green Chemistry Institute. To learn more about green chemistry and sustainability, please visit www.acs.org slash green chemistry. Morgan will be with us today for about one hour. After a short presentation, the, rema the remainder of the program belongs to you for our question and answer session. Because of the high attendance for today's webinar, we've had to mute your audio line. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. If you are on Twitter, please tweet us by including hashtag ACSWebinars in your message. Bob will screen all the questions as they come in and ask them to Morgan later during the Q&A session. We'll do our best to cover all the topics you propose, but we want to apologize in advance if we're unable to cover everything. If your question doesn't get answered, we invite you to join our ACS Webinars group on LinkedIn where you can continue the discussion with colleagues and speakers after today's presentation. And finally, we invite you to join ACS webinars every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to www.acswebinars.org, where you can register for upcoming live webinars and view on-demand content. You can also download Morgan's PowerPoint slides and view the recording of her presentation after the webinar is over today. A link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you using the address you provided when you registered. And so with that, let's get started. Bob and Morgan, the time is yours. Thanks, John. The ACS Green Institute is pleased to be able to host today's webinar. I think we all recognize the manufacturing sector has played a vital role in maintaining a robust national economy. It will continue to play that key role and is critically important to our recovery going forward. At the same time, the demands of an expanding population associated with the need for safe drinking water, food, energy, transportation, coupled with things like collapsing fisheries, global transport of pathogens, climate change, and etc., sends a clear message. It cannot be business as usual. All the indicators point to the fact that, in the eyes of nature, we cannot achieve a sustainable society by a linear extension of existing technologies. Such a conclusion requires one to ask, what can we do differently? That is where green chemistry, green engineering, and sustainable manufacturing come in. Just before I introduce Morgan, let me also remind you these materials and concepts are not some academic curiosity or unproven approach. These tools and techniques are well-documented ways to save money, grow markets, and gain competitive advantage. Now, turning to the subject at hand, it is my pleasure to introduce Morgan Barr. Morgan is an international economist at the Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration. She works in the agency's Manufacturing and Services Division on a variety of manufacturing and trade issues. Morgan has been working on the Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative for three years, leading the OECD Sustainable Metrics Toolkit Project, as well as working on the Sustainable Business Clearinghouse, the Regional Tour Program, and leading a project to develop a training module for manufacturers on the basics of sustainable manufacturing practices. Morgan has a Master of Arts in International Affairs and an MBA from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Her topic today is Department of Commerce Sustainability Manufacturing Initiative, Government Resources that Support Sustainable Manufacturing. Morgan, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Bob. Um, let me start off sort of by 
giving a quick, you know, I'm, I'm not a chemist. Um, I haven't taken chemistry since high school, but it's, it's a very interesting topic for me. And so today I'm hoping to give everyone some, some information that's useful both, you know, for you as chemists, but also you as, as members of your companies and things that, you know, if you have a, maybe a plant meeting and something comes up, you can say, hey, I heard, I heard about this thing that might be useful. So things you can share with um, the rest of, of your colleagues. Um, so today I'll start off by going over sort of where you know where I work and why why we why we're doing this and, and the links between what I do and green chemistry, um, and then I'll get into some of our current projects, uh, some other little things that we've been doing recently and we're going to be doing in the future that you might be interested in. Give a couple of examples of companies, both um, chemical companies and other manufacturers that have used sustainable chemistry, uh, green chemistry and sustainable manufacturing. Um, and then give you a list of, of some real key resources that, that might be helpful um, for, for your companies. So to get started, I work in the Manufacturing and Services Division, as, as Bob mentioned, um, which is one part of, of the International Trade Administration. Lots of different acronyms here in DC. Um, and, and to explain why, you know, to explain why we have the Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative, it's really because manufacturing and services is, is set up as to be the liaison with US industry and the, and the federal government. We are the chief advocate for the manufacturing and services sectors. Um, within the federal government, so we work on trade issues, we also work on regulatory issues, anything that comes up that can really affect industry, we're, we have a role in that. Um, and so we liaise with industry, we talk with companies all the time, we're organized by industry sector, so we actually have a chemicals team here um, in manufacturing and services, we also have health and consumer goods and forest products and autos, any sector you can think of, there's people here who are um, industry analysts that are, are, their role is to work with industry on issues that, that come up that affect industry competitiveness. So um, we really view sustainable manufacturing as a competitiveness issue for industry. I'll get into that in a, in a minute. Um, but I wanted to sort of start off by what's the link here between green chemistry um, and sustainable manufacturing. Um, and, and I have here our definition of sustainable manufacturing, which talks a lot about the, the process um, of, of making products and minimizing environmental impact, um, you know, conserving energy and natural resources, and making safe products um, for, for employees, communities, and consumers. And, but a key part of what, you know, what we're talking about here is that these are economically sound practices. A company that does everything um, you know, just to be sustainable and doesn't focus on the bottom line isn't going to stay in business very long. And so we're really trying to address that, that issue of the triple bottom line of, of you know, profits, people, and planet. Um, so some, when I was talking with Bob before, before our webinar, we talked a lot about these 12 principles of green chemistry, and I found a lot of linkages between the, the green chemistry principles, which are really focused on, on chemical processes and designing chemicals, and sort of a lot of the really common advice um, that we give to companies on sustainable manufacturing. So prevent pollution rather than treat it at the end. It's a lot easier, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Um, material efficiency, energy efficiency, um, making using um, products and things that are non-hazardous because you can avoid all of those regulatory costs um, using renewable materials and then designing for the end of life of your of your product. Um, so I think there's a lot of links between what what the goals of green chemistry are and and what sustainable manufacturing as a whole is trying to do. And I think moreover that green chemistry really um, enables sustainable manufacturing. I just wanted to give a couple of examples. So um, I work a lot with, with the carpet industry, and so we, we, you know, we've talked with them. It's, it's the development of Nylon 6, and then learning how to recycle that, and then, um, which was you know, a green chemistry kind of process, and then coming up with backings that are less hazardous and can be easily removed from, um, from the woven part of the carpet has really allowed for um, a huge sustainable manufacturing uh, innovation to take place in, in, in terms of carpet recycling and take-back programs, which have the potential to eliminate 
millions of pounds of waste a year. I mean, when we, I can just imagine we're going through a big renovation here at Commerce, how much carpet they're going to throw away in that process. And I hope that they do take the time to go find a way to recycle that. So that green chemistry innovation um, in, in the ability to recycle carpet has led to a really different mindset um, in how carpet is being sold. So we're seeing leasing programs, so you're renting carpet um, for a time and then getting it back. And so creating that closed loop system was really um, enabled by green chemistry. Another example is um, UV coating. So, you know, you, this ability to not have to cure um, paint and coatings um, with, with heat has saved tremendous amounts of energy um, and, and materials. And so that's allowed for new sustainable manufacturing processes um, that, that wouldn't have been enabled without that, that green chemistry component. And so all of this, like Bob said, can be really critical to a company's competitive advantage. And what we've found is that companies that are, are really dedicated to sustainable practices across the board, those are the ones that can really see the opportunities in it. Um, when you understand sustainable manufacturing and green chemistry, uh, you find that there's a, a million different ways to look at it and to um, gain a competitive advantage with that. Um, and I'm sorry if you hear a little bit of rumbling. We're having a thunderstorm here in D.C. and it's pouring. So if you hear some thunder, that's, that's what that, that is. Um, so to discuss sort of why we have this initiative, um, it really, you know, like I said, we, we work for industry. That we're, we're industry um, advocates. And so this whole initiative grew out of a need, an express need from companies. Um, so, you know, Going back to this idea of competitiveness, companies are facing a lot of pressures. You know, so we have material and natural resource costs, energy costs, um, supply pressures, whether you, you know, whether you can even have access to the materials and, and things that you need to produce your products. Um, you know, tons of new environmental and health regulations. We were talking about, you know, we, we just have two new chemicals bills um, in the House and Senate for, for Tosca reform, REACH. Um, you have state regulations, federal regulations, and then international regulations. So, and, and you never know what's going to happen next. So, um, it, it helps to be really proactive um, in terms of dealing with all these regulations. And then you have all of these customer demands, and it's not just from the end user. So, if you make, you know, cleaning products, it's not just the person who's using it in their home. It's the retailer saying, "I want a greener product." It's the government saying, "We want." Um, to purchase green products. We have a new Executive Order 13514, which is really going to push green procurement way beyond what we've, what we've seen in the past, um, even requiring um, greenhouse gas reporting from, from uh, companies that sell to the government. So you're seeing from every consumer, even if, even if you sell to another manufacturer, they want greener products and they want more data um, about, about the products that that they're receiving. So how do smaller manufacturers cope with this? How do you measure your sustainability? How do you provide this data in an efficient way um, to, to your consumers? And then if we're going to ask companies to do all of these things and to be greener and use less energy, that's going to require some capital costs. There's going to need to be new equipment and things that, that companies need to buy. And how do we um, make sure that companies have access to that capital. This is a huge issue right now, especially with the credit markets the way they are. Um, and so when we first met in 2007 with manufacturers, we had a big stakeholder event. We got everybody into one room. We had about 100 people from every industry. Um, and they asked us to start with sort of two basic areas. They said there's a lot of great resources out there from the government. There's a lot of great information. It's just way too complicated to go find it. Uh, you don't want to have to look on Department of Energy sites and EPA, and I don't know if you've ever tried to use a government search engine um, on one of these websites, but it's really difficult to find what you're looking for. So they said, put it all in one place. And they also said um, that a lot of, particularly smaller companies, hear all of these sustainability terms, but maybe don't really understand why it's important. 
from a business perspective, what are the benefits of it? Um, so you have OEM saying, we have a lot of small suppliers. We're trying to explain to them why it's important. But if you could do something to, to educate um, companies about the benefits of, of sustainable manufacturing. So um, we took those two industry requests, and that's led to our, we've had four main project areas um, in the first, the first two years of, of our initiative. The first one was, if, if resources are spread out across the whole government, let's um, get the whole government together to talk about what the issues are and what companies need. And so we created an interagency working group um, on sustainable manufacturing. We have a lot of different agencies on there. You can see like Department of Defense is on there to talk about their procurement issues, NASA, um, Federal Trade Commission to talk about greenwashing and, and making sure companies know how to make good green claims. Um, we've got Department of Labor to work with um, companies on, on um, retraining, you know, training programs for their employees. So we try to bring together, and we're always adding new people to this to this list. Um, anyone who's interested in sustainable manufacturing, so we are talking to each other. Um, our second project, and this is probably the most useful one um, for for all of all of you out there, is our um, sustainable business clearinghouse. And this goes to that first issue of centralizing resources. And what we did was we created a searchable one-stop database of um, federal and state government programs and resources that support sustainable business. And there's over 800 sites in there now. We're always adding new, new ones. Um, and soon we're going to be actually revamping it, expanding it, improving it um, to include actually NGO and um, uh, industry association resources too. So soon it'll be everything in one stop, not just, not just government. And I just sort of want to show you that really quickly. Um, and show you how to how to get there. So if you go to manufacturing.gov backslash sustainability, you'll see our website. Um, okay, you can see it now. Um, and if you click on the right side here, uh, it says Sustainable Business Clearinghouse. Um, and that will bring open the uh, home page for the Sustainable Business Clearinghouse. And there's instructions and stuff how to use it, but it's, it's not very complicated. Um, and when you open it, you can search by federal program here, or you can search by state programs. And we're always interested in hearing if you have you find something you think it's useful that we should add, just send us an email. Um, and then you can search by different you know different issues. So green chemistry is actually in here as one, but there's tons of other other issues you can search for. You can search by industry. You don't have to. And then you can search for the type of information you want. So if you're interested. Um, in tax incentives, you're not finding how-to guides and other things. And so when you hit search, it comes up with a list of programs. So Green Chemistry right now has 27 different programs and resources um, in it. So that's our uh, sustainable manufacturing or sustainable business clearinghouse, which I hope you'll all take a look at and, and use and let us know if you find it useful. Like I said, we are going to be doing some improvements to make it easier to use and, and um, allow you to sort the information that comes out of it. But we're, we're really trying to provide um, a useful resource for, for companies that, that you can just go to one place and you don't have to search a bunch of different agencies' websites to try to find all of these issues. Um, so I'd like to now talk about our third program, which is the Sustainable Manufacturing American Regional Tours Program, or SMART program, which is a very common acronym, but ends up meaning a whole bunch of different things. Uh, um, but for us, it's these pro this is this goes back to that awareness issue. How do you show companies that this is something that can be good for their bottom line um, and how they can implement it too, to make it less overwhelming. Um, and so what we do is we take field trips and we will go to a city, we'll find three or four companies that are sustainability leaders in that area. We'll tour their facilities, and we'll take with us about 30 small manufacturers from that region. Um, and so this really closes the familiarity gap um, for companies. They get to see how their peers have done it um, and how they, you know, where they've found success, where they've had problems, what are some best practices, lessons learned. 
um, some technologies that they've, they've found useful. A lot of technologies can be used across industries. Um, sometimes we have industry-specific um, smarts. We've actually done the aerospace industry. We have a couple of textiles, ones coming up, um, and then a, a forest products, one coming up. And so the other thing we do in these is we bring with us federal, state, local resource providers. They're right there on the tour. So when the companies see things that they have ideas about and they might want to implement in their own um, facilities, there's people right there to help them um, get started. And so we've had seven of these uh, so far. The last one, you saw the picture there, has um, had Secretary Locke, the Secretary of Commerce, and, and uh, Representative Sten Steny Hoyer. Um, and so we've had seven, over 200 people have attended them. They've found them really useful. Um, and like I said, our next one will be September 14th in Richmond, Virginia, um, where we'll be focusing on energy efficiency in the forest products sector. So if you're interested in that and you're in the Richmond area, um, just check out our website for more information. There's some, some information posted right now. Um, our fourth main project has been uh, the, the OECD Sustainable Manufacturing Metrics Project. Um, and Bob and I talked a little, a little bit about the difference between the metrics we're looking at and, the, and green chemistry metrics. And ours are really at the facility level. Um, and the goal here is companies are saying, like, we're doing good things. Maybe the company down the road is saying they're doing good things. But how do we know where we stack up against other people? because the, there's a lot of different metrics out there, but they're meant for reporting. They're not meant for comparing um, results from different companies. And so they asked for an internationally accepted, simplified set of metrics that companies can use um, to measure their progress, compare themselves to others. And then um, this, our, our toolkit is actually going to help um, once you've measured where you are, it's going to include a component to um, set, how do you set priorities of areas that you should focus on, and then also how do you make decisions about what improvements to make. So there's a cost-benefit analysis component to it. Um, so there's some information on our website right now um, about this, and the toolkit we're hoping will be out by the end of 2010, but it's an international process, so it's um, sometimes a little more time-consuming than, than you think. Um, but we've had really good support from U.S. industry, a lot of involvement from U.S. companies on it. Um, and, and so we're, we're hoping that, that um, we, can, we can have that out by the end of 2010. So just to go over a few other things that we're working on or have done um, in the last year, we had our 2009 um, Sustainability and U.S. Competitiveness Summit. Um, that was in October, so we had our first event in 2007. We did a lot of the things that, that companies asked us to do. We brought them back um, last year and said, okay, we did these things. What else do you want us to do? And that set um, a set of priorities for us um, um, for, for 2010. Um, and another event we've held this year is the Green Finance Roundtable. Um, so we hear a lot of, you know, going back to that financing issue and capital cost issue, um, this area, this space of green finance isn't well known. Um, so we worked with our financial services office to host that. There's some information on our website about that. Um, I'm working on um, Sustainable Manufacturing 101 training. So that should provide basic information to manufacturers on sustainable manufacturing practices and how, you know, how to use the clearinghouse to find more information once they're, they have some familiarity with, with the different topics. And we're working with our interagency group to, to put that together. Uh, like I said, we're expanding the clearinghouse. We have um, a SMART on the forest product sector, some other in, uh, industry-specific SMARTs. Um, another event that everyone might be interested in is our Forum on Industrial Water Use, which is coming up on September 23rd, and that'll be here in D.C. Um, we have some great speakers from uh, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, uh, the World Resources Institute, uh, World Wildlife Foundation, all talking about sort of what is the state of industrial water use and how are we going to be um, impacted as you know, climate change happens and population growth happens and populations move to areas where there's less water, um, how is that going to, to affect industrial water use? Um, we're also working on some sectoral analysis of uh, the specific 
uh, issues, sustainability issues affecting different industries. Um, and I think we're hoping to do some, some work on green chemistry coming up in, in that, in terms of that. Um, and then in addition, we're working on, I mentioned the executive order on, um, on green procurement. So we're working with the GSA to make the implementation of that easy, uh, especially for small businesses. We're looking into, uh, we do some legislative regulatory analysis and then some green skills work. So, so for, for employees, what kinds of skills do they need in, in the area of sustainable manufacturing? Um, so I want to give a couple of, of examples of sort of the intersection between sustainable manufacturing and green chemistry. So I, I sort of mentioned um, the, the recycling program for, for carpet. So Shaw Floors won um, the 2003 Presidential Green Chemistry Award for their EcoWorks carpet tile. They designed a less hazardous um, carpet backing that also is easily separated from um, the front of the carpet and allows for easier recycling. Um, and so what that has enabled them to do is do a huge carpet take back program and, and they've really been able to market that carpet tile as environmentally friendly um, and sustainable. But in addition to that, Shaw does a variety of sustainable manufacturing practices. They um, have been pioneers in, in waste to energy in the carpet. Um, in the carpet industry, they do a lot of water recycling. Um, they've done a lot of other water projects, such as continuous dyeing and, and reuse of dye baths that have saved a lot of water and money for them. Water costs money too. Um, and they use uh, used cooking oil for, for biodiesel to, to power their boilers in some of their facilities. So here's a company that has both um, used green chemistry principles and, and green chemistry practices but also a variety of sustainable manufacturing practices across their uh, production process. Another, another leader in sustainable manufacturing, manufacturing is 3M. Um, they have one of the longest running, I think, sustainability programs that I've heard of. Um, they've had their pro pollution prevention pays program since, I think, 1975. And this has eliminated more than 3 billion pounds of pollution, and it has saved the company $1.4 billion, um, and they only measure, I think they only measure the savings for the first year, so they don't compound that year to year. Um, and they're really, they use a lot of uh, lean analysis um, to, in their production process, and they incorporate sustainability principles into that. Um, so that's their, one of their approaches to, to sustainability. Um, and one example of a program that's sort of um, a project, actually, that They've, they've been able to save a lot of um, money and also a green chemistry kind of project is in one of their facilities, I think in Brazil, they um, replaced a solvent-based process with a water-based process and that eliminated the use of 45 tons of solvent um, in the first year. The emissions from all of that solvent, so the environmental impact um, um, from that. and then. Also, because they didn't have the solvent emissions, they didn't need the pollution prevention equipment, so they saved all the energy that that was using. Um, and that is going to end up saving them, it, it was projected that they'd save $850,000 just in the first year of that project. Um, so that's an example of sort of the, the intersection of, of, of green chemistry and um, sustainable manufacturing. And then a chemical company example would be um, this example, which is from the Department of Energy the Terra Nitrogen Company, which they had a plant, an ammonia plant, that received an energy assessment from the Department of Energy Save Energy Now program. Um, and it found a lot of improvements that could made, be made to the plant's steam system, which um, steam systems, I guess, in, in a lot of chemical companies are a big uh, user of energy. And so they implemented um, several of the, the different um, suggestions from the assessment, and it saved um, annually about 497,000, well, I guess, billion um, BTUs um, and then uh, $3.5 million a year. And the cost was only $3.1 million, so they had a payback period of about 11 months. Um, and they're using what they learned in that plant and doing the same, similar things in different plants um, in the company. So those are just a few, a few examples. There's lots more out there of um, companies that, that have done both you know, 
green chemistry, sustainable manufacturing, and, and a company that's taken advantage of a really helpful government resource that's available. So now moving on to um, available government resources, um, I want to talk about a few, a few programs that you can also find in the clearinghouse. These are all in there, but these are programs that I think would be really helpful for companies um, in, in the chemical industry um, or many, many, any manufacturers might, might find these useful. So the first one um, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce. And in addition to the program I'm going to talk about, they do a lot of manufacturing research. So you may want to check out the different areas that they're um, they're working on. There's a lot of um, programs that they have that might be might be in your area. Um, but the Manufacturing Extension Partnership or MEP program um, is a technical assistance program for small and medium sized manufacturers. They have offices in every state and Puerto Rico, um, and they provide low cost technical assistance on not just sustainability issues but any issue affecting a manufacturer. So they're a good resource in general for manufacturers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then uh, a group we work, we also work really closely with is the Department of Energy Industrial Technologies program, and they run the Save Energy Now program I was just talking about. Um, and they actually do a lot of specific work with the chemicals industry, and there's a link here to the page um, on the chemicals industry. There's a link to the Save Energy Now program, which companies can actually join. Um, and, and it's, it's a voluntary program. And then um, they also provide the state incentives and resource database. And this is a great database of, um, sort of tax incentives, any other rebates and things that are available for energy efficiency programs for manufacturers. So if your company is thinking about doing some uh, energy efficiency work, it's a good place to look and see um, potential offsets for the, for the costs of those programs. But the Industrial Technology Program has, oh my gosh, they have like a thousand pages on their website and they're all really interesting and really useful. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. Um, from EPA, uh, they have the Green Chemistry Program, which works, I think, with ACS on the Presidential Green Chemistry Pro, um, Award Program. Uh, so there's a lot of great, great information and tools on their website on green chemistry. Um, I had also talked to sort of about the, the use of lean in sustainable manufacturing, and EPA actually put out um, several guides on, on how lean and sustainability can go together, but they have a lean and chemicals toolkit you might find useful. Um, EPA also has the Design for the Environment program, which um, certifies products in a number of different product categories on sustainability. And then the Pollution Prevention Program has a lot of great resources um, for companies of all kinds on pollution prevention. And they have regional centers and do some technical assistance on, on compliance, but also um, pollution prevention products. Um, we talked about the use of renewables and things in, in green chemistry. Well, USDA has the BioPreferred program, um, which is an advocate for um, bio-based products. And another good co collaborative program between EPA and the Department of Commerce um, through the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership is the Green Suppliers Network, which is a technical assistance program um, that works with companies on sustainability practices specifically. Um, so those are just a few of, well, like I said, there's over 800 different programs and resources um, in the clearinghouse. But I think these are some of the sort of top programs and ones that, that this audience would find most useful. Um, So I just want to conclude with saying that, um, you know, reminding you that, that our, our initiative is a service-focused, demand-driven initiative. We're here um, to help. So if you need anything, if you have any questions, if there's a resource you're looking for and you can't find, let us know. Um, I also encourage you to check out our website. Um, you can sign up for email update, updates there. Um, so we, we often uh, share with our email list upcoming events, um, both our events and then events from other, other agencies. If there's new programs or, or resources that are available, we'll post those there. So um, please sign up for, for email updates. And um, I hope you found this useful. So I'll turn it back over to Bob uh, for, for questions, if anyone has any. Well, thanks, Megan, for a great presentation. Tons of good information here. 
We, we have several questions in the queue, but I also want to remind our listeners that you can continue to submit questions by the questions panel. You can also submit questions by Twitter using the hashtag ACSWebinars, all one word. So let's, uh, Morgan, what I'm going to do is uh, look over at our first question here for you, and it goes like this. How should actions against sustainability standards be reported externally by companies? Hmm. Actions against sustainability standards? Well, I, I, I think, you know, the word against just simply means how, how do we go about reporting uh, externally? And I guess there's probably some, some element of confidential business information sensitivity there as well. You know, we've hmm. got to balance these two objectives. Yeah, it is. It's really difficult. I mean, because you know, sustainability standards aren't always mandatory, and that's a difficult question. You asked the hard one right right off the bat. Um, and I know, I know that the issue of, of confidential information is is really difficult for companies. Um, so, are they asking like if a, a company isn't compliant with the sustainability standard, how they would report? that? Well, I don't know. Maybe what I'll do is ask our question submitter if they would like to uh, submit a follow-up for clarification. In the meantime, you know, I might offer that the ACS Green Chemistry Institute is working very hard with a, with a, uh, through an ANSI process, uh, which <laughs> is a voluntary consensus process to develop a greener chemical products and processes for the manufacture of those products standard right now. And we're about 16 months into this, and it's quite quite a challenging uh, quite a challenging endeavor, but we, we're making good progress, and we hope mm -hmm. to issue that standard uh, before the end of the year. So perhaps we'll move on to another question and see if we get clarification on that one. Uh, yeah, that, that would be great. But I, I agree, standards development is is really difficult, and um, we actually we do have a standards office here um, in manufacturing and services, and and so they. They've been grappling with these same issues of, of sustainability standards, and also NIST has um, a program too that in their manufacturing engineering laboratory that's working on um, the issues of sustainability standards. So, so another question, Megan is Morgan is, can you talk more about the Advanced Technologies Program and other similar opportunities for innovation partnerships? The Advanced Technologies Program. This is the, the NIST program. Um, I don't work with anyone over there, um, but I know that uh, we do have some people here who are more uh, familiar with that program at NIST. Um, and I know through, too, through the uh, Industrial Technologies Program at, at the Department of Energy, um, they do develop energy efficient. They work collaboratively with, with industry to develop um, energy efficiency sort of technologies for, for specifically for that industry and um, that's another another route you can take but the uh, advanced technology program is actually not a program I have uh, worked with so that's a question that I can't really answer but I can certainly um, follow up with anyone who who uh, is interested in learning more about that I can get more information and post it Okay, Morgan, another question for you. And after this question, I'm going to remind our listeners that we're probably going to uh, take advantage of the tools available through this webinar and push out a poll question that will come from our organizers here after this question is addressed. So, uh, Morgan, has the DOC evaluated any of the sustainability ratings offered by companies, for example, like risk metrics? Um, no, I mean it's it's difficult for us um, as a as a federal government organization. We can't pick winners, um, and through our work with the OECD, um, we weren't doing the analysis. They they were doing the analysis there, and I know that they've looked at um, lots of different ways of measuring sustainability, and they've sort of discussed the pros and cons of each, but weren't really choosing one method over over another. Um, but it's it's difficult, you know, when we're talking about things like 
eco labels and ratings. Um, there isn't, you know, there isn't one government um, sanctioned standard. And so, you know, while we may have, um, you know, individual opinions on on different kinds of, of standards and, and um, metric sets that that uh, we can't really choose. We haven't we haven't really gotten into that area of um, you know which ones work best and which ones don't. Now there there is some work being done at EPA on on those issues, um, but it's not an area. I think it's an area we're definitely going to have to get into more in the future. But it's not one that that we've been able to devote a lot of resources to, or um, because we're the government make any decisions, yes or no, on 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 any of those systems. But there's just there's so many of them out there now. It's getting more and more complex. Okay, for our listeners, um, there is a poll that's just been put out, and if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to respond to that poll, and uh, we'll move on to the next question in just a moment. Morgan? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, while we're conducting that poll, uh, I'm going to ask you the next question. <clears throat> sure. this, is, this is a follow-up from the previous question about sustainability standards. Maybe a clarification here for us. Okay. It said, um, sorry, I've got to find it here. How can external stakeholders measure how a company is meeting sustainability standards? And I guess they're talking about standards that may have been issued by either an agency or by an independent voluntary process like an ANSI standard or some such thing. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's that's a difficult thing. And I know you and I have, have we had a brief discussion about about greenwashing. And if um, you know, if a company says you know we follow this standard or not, or we're certified or not, how how do you trust it? And there's really, I don't really have a, a good answer for that because a lot of them are voluntary and you have to sort of count on good reporting and maybe third party um, verification of whether the company has met those standards or not. And I know in our discussions with um, different groups, uh, how do you ensure that that's valid data is, is, is difficult um, or even having those discussions within the government um, for, you know, different voluntary programs we have. How do you ensure that what, what companies are reporting is, is accurate? Um, and I know there's been different studies of, of the way things are reported and they've found um, that standards are either interpreted differently or implemented differently and so there's, there's usually a lot of variation in how accurate the reportings are. And, you know, I, I'm an economist, and I constantly want perfect information, and we just don't have it in any area. So that it's it's difficult, um, it really is. But I think I think third party certification is probably going to be um, sort of a, a way of making sure that the probably the easiest way of making sure that that's um, accurate information. I know I know Bob, you guys have been working with NSF on on these these green party green chemistry certifications and things too. So um, they're they're a, a third party certifier for for a lot of different sustainability um, issues, but they're just one of many. Great, thanks, Morgan. I guess the other thing I would suggest is that uh, there's you know, when we talk about uh, certification or compliance to a standard, there's usually three three forms of doing that. One is self-declaration or self-certification. That's the, the first level. The second level might be um, second party certification, which would be someone like a trade organization. The concern is the trade organization may have a vested industry interest in the industry and the outcome. The third level of certification is obviously independent third party certification, where you have a uh, recognized authority come in, do a conformance assessment, and then issue a 
certificate of compliance with the standard against which you're performing. So I see that um, the results of the poll are on the screen. And uh, you, you can see the questionnaire and the results that have come in. Looks like that at least a third of the listeners are going to plan to take advantage of government resources uh, available to guide them in sustainable manufacturing going forward. Um, about half of the listeners are not quite sure yet. So maybe the result of the seminar will, will move them in that direction. So, so let me uh, offer another question for Morgan at this point. Um, <clears throat> this question is focused on bio-preferred programs or products as some coming from the import, imported manufacturers. Uh, how do you introduce bio-preferred programs to imported manufacturers, especially for bio-based products like plastic lunch plates or paper cups? So how, how would they take advantage of those programs? Well, I think how, you, how can a manufacturer or a um, you know, a uh, third party introduce programs like this, taking advantage of some of the things that you've talked about in your um, sustainable manufacturing initiative, maybe to get the word out, make people aware of the advantages of these types of products, the manufacturing processes that go along with these products? Mm -hmm. But, but um, internationally. Well, the question was, um, there, apparently, this is a U.S. manufacturer that's using a, a, a ex-U.S. manufacturer to produce the product that they're importing into the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm kind of confused about, I, I mean, the, the, the BioPreferred program, I, I, I know, does focus on products that are um, um, made in the United States. Uh, so I don't know if they would be eligible for that, but I can, um, you know, we can certainly uh, look into that. But we get a lot of questions too, and this may not be directly addressing the the question, but um, we get a lot of questions from other governments about sort of how we do things here versus how they do them in, in other countries, and and um, I know that there's interest in developing similar um, programs and, and resources in, in countries that don't uh, don't have them at this time. Um, so we've talked to you know, the government of Korea, we've talked to the Swedish government and Hong Kong and um, different countries. Uh, but I know that a lot of the bio-based products, we recently switched to bio-based plates and things here um, in our cafeteria. So we may be actually using their products. Um, and I think they're made internationally. So I know a lot of bio-based products are made made abroad. Um, but it's um, it's an area I can I can definitely follow up and talk with um, our colleagues at USDA. But it's uh, bio-based products is an area of, of expertise for me. So let me uh, give you another question here, Morgan, sure. comes from a slightly different direction. Are there any programs specifically in the auto sector that you guys are aware of or that you're working with? Um, yes, there, and there's some NGO work too that's that's um, being done um, in the auto sector. Uh, so you can look in our um, in our um, clearinghouse. But like one group we work really closely with is the Suppliers Partnership for the Environment, which is based entirely. Um, on its auto suppliers. And I know some of their recent work has actually focused on, if I get this correct, eliminating hazardous chemicals from the manufacturing process of the products inside the cabin of the car. Um, so that's, that's definitely a group I would, I would look into if you're in, in the auto sector. Um, and then in auto communities, a lot of the um, a lot of the resources I was describing, they have, like the MEP will have um, a person who's, who's an expert on, on the auto sector. So too, if, if you're in an area where um, your company is in that sector and there's a lot of other companies, it's likely that, that some of the resources in that area have specific expertise um, on that sector. But I know um, there's, there's definitely some specific resources out there for that. And, and the government as a whole has been focusing on auto communities um, um, with the, the economic downturn and stuff. So there, there's definitely um, a lot of resources out there. Um, 
in that area. Okay, thanks, Morgan. I have another question for you. Are there any specific resources for industrial wastewater treatment plants to learn about relevant sustainable products? Yes. Um, if you go into under under um, water quality or water quantity in, in the um, clearinghouse, there's a couple of really great guides on, on industrial water use and um, that describe some of the, the technologies that are out there. We also have here, um, we have an Office of Energy and Environmental Industries, and they have a water products team. And that, that team covers um, the uh, water products industry. And so uh, they have some information on their website about um, work they've done with, with that industry. Um, but there are a couple of really great guides um, from the state of North Carolina and a couple of others on industrial water treatment and water quality that are in um, the um, in the clearinghouse. And I know that the uh, EPA really focuses on on water quality. So through, through their water programs the, um, in the Office of Water, there should be some good information on that. Um, and I, too, encourage you um, to check on our website. If you can't attend our upcoming industrial water use event, to check after that. Um, we'll post um, the guy who's been Organizing that event has done a tremendous amount of resource on industrial water use, um, and we'll be posting sort of a catalog of papers and, and research that he's done into it. Um, I was like, "You're going to do all the research on on industrial water use? You know, write it all down and put it in one place so we can get that out to companies." So um, that's an area where we should actually be posting a lot of additional information very soon. Okay, okay here's another question for you, Morgan slightly different direction again. New chemicals are highly restricted through TOSCA review versus existing chemicals. This slows implementation and success affecting future product development implementation by customers afraid of being accused of being non-compliant. Even when the details are communicated to TOSCA, no relief seems to exist on regulation and the new chemistry is being held to a much higher standard. What's a chemist to do Nothing is perfect, only better. And this might be a good opportunity to talk a little bit about there's no such thing as a green chemical process, but greener chemicals and processes. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, that's how um, there's no such thing as a green company or a green product. Every, you know, products aren't made out of clouds and unicorns. You know, everything uses energy, uses materials. And so, you know, we always describe um, sustainability as a journey. So I agree, like... Um, things only, you know, you, sometimes you get marginal improvements, sometimes you get big improvements. Um, Tosca reform, uh, our chemicals office is really working on that. Um, so I, I'm, that's an area where I, I don't have a lot of uh, specific involvement, but I have heard a lot of um, questions from industry and even um, other government agencies about dealing with, you know, within within the regulations and then whether, um, like, whether task is what's affecting what goes into a product or what, uh, whether reach is too because um, a lot of companies that are, you know, buying products from overseas or they're affected by that too. So it's, it's really difficult and um, I don't have a good answer. I can I can definitely refer you to our, our chemicals office if it's an issue your company is specifically having, and, and um, you know they'd be happy to to discuss it with you. But it's an area they're they're working on um, with with Tosca reform. But I think it's certainly an area of an increasing concern um, in, with with the public. So uh, I I don't know that it's going to get easier, but I, I, as I want to see things happen efficiently, but there's always a fine line between, you know, expediting things and making sure everything's safe, and, and so um, I would suggest definitely reaching out to, to our chemicals office if it's a specific issue your company is facing, though. Um, they'd be a good Morgan? resource to talk to. Uh-huh. Uh, we have time for one more question. Okay. And that question is, have you heard anything about the Werner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry? I have not, but um, 
I am not, the, this is the first time I've actually really discussed green chemistry, so um, that's not, um, that didn't come up in my research for this project, though. The Warner Babcock Institute? Maybe I can help you. Um, the Warner sure Babcock. you heard of it, Bob. Sure. <laughs> so for the sake of our listeners, I'll just let folks know, the Warner Babcock Institute is a for-profit enterprise in the Boston area of Massachusetts uh, that was started by uh, John Warner, who is one of the founders of green chemistry, and his mission is to uh, actually implement the principles of green chemistry. So he works with companies around the world to help solve their problems uh, quietly but effectively. So if you're interested, I'm sure you can Google the Warner Babcock Institute and um, get some more information and contact them if you'd like. So uh, Morgan, um, it looks like we're out of time. So I would just like to ask if you'd like to share any final thoughts with our listeners before we close out. Um, just that, you know, we're here as a resource. If you have any additional questions, feel free to email me. If I don't know the answer, which a lot of the questions today were about things that I, I uh, um, it's not specific areas of expertise for me, but I will go out and find the answers if, if, um, if you have additional questions. And, and I hope that you'll take advantage of the resources that are out there for you. Well, thank you, Morgan, very much for a wonderful presentation and all your follow-up answers. I'd like to thank all of the listeners for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. I will apologize if we didn't get to your questions today in the interest of time. And um, I think our organizers here will share with you how there can be follow-up at the end. So with, John, with that, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. And thank you, Morgan, for a great presentation. As Bob said, if we were unable to get to your question today, we apologize, but we invite you to join our ACS webinars group on LinkedIn where you can continue this discussion. And before we go today, I want to remind everyone that this ACS webinar was co-produced with the ACS Green Chemistry Institute and invite you to acswebinars.org slash green chemistry. I also want to remind our listeners about the upcoming ACS webinar. Do you want to present your research with the confidence, power, and clarity that leaves a strong impact on your audience? The often repeated cliche, it's not what you say, but how you say it is true, and nobody understands this as well as our next speaker. We invite you to join us next week, August 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, when Nicholas Washenko, owner of Washenko Communications, will teach you how to deliver a powerful, confident presentation that gets results. Go to acswebinars.org slash events to register. And if you'd like to suggest future topics for ACS webinars, please send us an email at acswebinars at acs.org. As you exit this webinar, please remember to complete the short survey. This survey uh, helps us improve our program. Also remember that you will receive an email from us containing a link to the recording of today's presentation. This wraps up the, today's event. Thanks again to Bob and Morgan and to everyone for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next week. This ACS webinar was brought to you as a service of the American Chemical Society, serving its members and scientific professionals by connecting you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders in chemical sciences, management, and business. ACS Webinars does not endorse any products or services. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the American Chemical Society. American Chemical Society, copyright 2010, all rights reserved.